Thank you for having me here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here among you and um, a great honor to speak after Mr. Makridakis. What I'm going to talk about here is something that you don't know about Bitcoin. And I know the audience. What are the odds? So, Bitcoin, in essence, is an artificial intelligence machine. And you should go, wow, now. <laughs> okay. And I have the proof for it. Let's start with a philosophical question. What is intelligence? This was said by Stephen Hawking, and you're intelligent enough to read it, but I will do it for you. Intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. This is the primary uh, concept of evolution. If we didn't do that, we wouldn't be able to be ourselves now. We would be something else, or at all. How did, you, how did you, we, you, we guys get into intelligence? This is our brain. Every new information is recorded as a memory. We form synapses and then a neural network that combines all two and is able to produce results for our problems. In order to define artificial intelligence, we need to simulate our functions. How did we get intelligent? AI is a big thing right now. Uh, Mr. Makridakis nearly uh, said everything about it. The AlphaGo, Google's latest self-learning AI is like an alien civilization inventing its own mathematics. I assure you, it can do that. How do, we, how do you build one? This is a set of computers, network. It consists of nodes, collaborating algorithms, and it forms a neural network. It's a simulation of our brain. This is what it is. We, we, we should go back to the bio, biology. Biology started from a prokaryote. We became, uh, through a trillion of billions of mutations, what we are now. And here's the secret ingredient. Nature evolves randomly. We need to simulate nature's way. The key element is randomness, and it's very important that you understand this. But what random really means? This is the father of randomness. This is Mr. Edward Norton Lawrence. He was the first one who decided to map randomness in nature. Believe me, he did it in 1951. It was an amazing task back then. And it, this is what he found. He collected a, a very big amount of uh, weather data, and he managed, to, he managed to put it inside a big computer, one of, uh, of the Times computer, and the computer came up with this truncated Navier-Stokes system. There's a differential system with the triplet of the three numbers uh, on, on the right, you can alter these three numbers and you produce a whole new chaos. So, this is what it is. Another way to produce randomness came up rather uh, recently. This is Rule 110 Cellular Automaton. In computability theory, a cellular automaton is able to be Turing complete if it is able to simulate a single tape Turing machine, I will explain all of this in a, in a little while. But this is what it looks like. Such a cellular automaton, after a certain period of time, can provide mathematically modeled deterministic chaos, which is similar to the chaotic phenomena like a tropical storm. In essence, it simulates nature. Because if you want to build an artificial intelligence, you cannot really go to nature and say, please give me the randomness of yours. It cannot be done. So we needed another mathematical way to do it. By the way, this is deterministic chaos, for those of you who know about it. This is a new story uh, of uh, October 24, 
2017, it's, it's an error there. Uh, there was a prize about uh, proving another cellular automaton, a two-state, three-color, which is this one. If it is a Turing machine, it's a universal Turing machine, that means it is able to produce results for complex problems. All right? And a 20-year-old guy proved it in the, into four page, 40 pages. 25,000 prize. So, a little bit of history here. All started in 1951 uh, at the Higgson Symposium by John von Neumann. He introduced the, the concept of a cellular automaton. In 1971, a two-state, two-dimensional cellular automaton game, the name of life, uh, was introduced by John Conway. It's very, very famous now. In 1983, Stephen Wolfram from Wolfram Research did a systematic study of two-state, one-dimensional cellular automata based on a specific set of rules, and they named elementary cellular automata. And finally, in 2002, his research assistant, Matthew Cook, showed that one of these rules is Turing complete, which is rule 110. Their work has been published in their best-selling book, A New Kind of Science, very, very famous. How do we use a cellular automaton to compute things? First, we need it to let it produce chaos. Second, you, you take this chaos and direct it into a genetic algorithm. When the maximum fitness is due, a cellular evolutionary algorithm, or if you prefer, a genetic algorithm is the same thing, is produced and then stored. This is what it looks like. It's, the first one is generation zero, generation 50, generation 100. The fitness goes better and better as we go. Here are some examples of neighborhoods in cellular uh, evolutionary algorithm. Linear, compact, diamond, and any other. It can, it can look like anything you can imagine. Here's some math about it. I won't go deep into that, but it's good to know that the process can be manipulated. That means when a GA is forming, you can alter it the way you want it. And here is it, uh, how, how a basic genetic algorithm looks like. You have a problem and you want a solution. I, I used to be a programmer, and a rather uh, old one. We programmers got lazy. So, we decided that it's okay, our old programs can still be working because the computers are getting faster and faster, so we can do our job and we don't have to program anymore. So the problem arises and we needed a new way of writing programs and this is how we did it. So this is a self-writing program, in essence. You start with a basic program that uh, the, the basic problem that needs a solution and start from initial population, a random one. You have a basic calculation of fitness. I will describe this very, very simply. Uh, say that you want to calculate the square root of two, all right? You give it the upper limit and the down limit and you tell the program, I want it to calculate it for me with, uh, let's say, an accuracy of 10 digits. You do that all in the top. And then the genetic algorithm is able to alter itself to compute things at a higher level. And it does it very, very fast. Right? So when the maximum fitness is due, then the GA stores itself. That means we have a memory. I want you to, to map it in your mind like that. This is a specialized genetic algorithm. It's a chaotic, chaotic genetic algorithm. It is very same with the previous one, but where Lorentz is introduced, it means chaos. We introduced a natural randomness in there. And the reason why we do this, it's because there are several studies that showed a random parameter is replaced by chaos. The fitness procedures last less and the process finishes earlier. So we need this. We need it to, to, be, to be faster. 
This is a simple Turing machine. I, I, I looked very hard for, for this picture, really. Uh, I wanted this to be as simple as possible. The Turing machine consists of two elements, the computational head and an unbounding long tape. You have a head that reads and writes in, the ter in, in, in Bitcoin when we have a read uh, head, uh, sorry, a write head, uh, and it is permanent. That means you cannot alter it. And the tape is divided into an unbounded set of boxes. The term unbounded means something nearly infinite, but not infinite, right? But it's big enough to be considered as such. And this is a, a classic representation of what I think blockchain is. A, uh, sorry, Mr. McVeigh, it's, it is very simple, but... Blockchain is a representation of a recording cylinder similar to Edison's standard phonograph. This is the head, and this is the cylinder. The cylinder is able to be unbounded. That means you can imagine this very, very long, right? So the transactions are being recorded in blocks forming a spiral of ellipses from left to right, whereas the recording is permanent in the cylinder, virtually unbounded. This is the concept. And enough with the terminology. <laughs> There's a question here. Cellular automaton and blockchain. <coughs> Rule 110 is proved to be Turing complete, while blockchain can be considered an unbounded single tape Turing medium, which is also Turing complete. The question is, will it blend? Our scientist here says that it does. And here's some proof about it. This is the median life of unspent transaction output consumed in a block on Bitcoin blockchain. The data comes from a site, uh, oxt.me. The Bitcoin UTXO lifespan prediction is shown by Robert Conrad and Stephen Pinto in 2015 that is impossible to be modeled mathematically because it is purely chaotic. That means it's random. Now, the $1 million question is, what is this line doing there? This is purely chaotic. That means that you cannot predict anything inside it. But there exists a line. At the same period, this is the main pool transaction volume in megabytes. This is what the RAM of Bitcoin is. Blockchain is the hard disk. This is the RAM of it, the random access memory. And the compute computational engine is a neural network, right? And this is a legit <laughs> explanation of what happened there. So there are four stages of, evolu of evolution of an AI. The first one is Turing complete. That means basic computational functions. The second one came from a paper from Church Turing. Both were scientists, I'm sure you know them. Uh, and is able to produce advanced computational functions. This is what I'm talking about in my paper, which was uh, written uh, last summer. A Church Turing Deutsch principle machine, that means universal computing. That means it can calculate problems that represent physical problems, everyday problems, right? And here you have it, artificial intelligence. I'm not sure that Bitcoin is here yet, but it will be. And I, explain, and I will explain why. This is a nearly complete chart of neural networks, right? How neural networks look like. Universal computing goes to artificial intelligence through a process, an evolutionary process that is called Moran model. Not Moron, Moran, all right? It was named after the scientist who found it. A Moran model is a simple stochastic process that is used in biology. I'm also a biologist, by the way, and is able to describe f finite populations. We are a species, as a species, we are using this model to evolve. This is how we did it. The mathematics behind it and the theory is overwhelming. I won't go into deep 
on this on these subjects, but if you want, I can talk about it if you want uh, later. So, we use machine learning f to go from universal computing to artificial intelligence on a neural, neural Turing machine, which is something like that. And it's going to be soon. Because the process of machine learning is rather difficult. You don't do it in seconds, because it takes time. Now, we already have AI. Why do we need a decentralized one? If I was Satoshi Nakamoto, which I am not, I would say you that we need it for the same jobs, but we need it to be decentralized because of the reason you said before. Because we need it to be non-controllable, right? So, you can use it for big data mining, Monte Carlo-based predictions, hidden Markov model predictions, expansion of human knowledge, really, you can do anything you like. This is only a subset of the fields that could potentially benefit. And about the future uses. One of the most difficult problems in uh, bioinformatics, I'm also a bioinformatician, sorry, uh, is analyzing biological ontologies. My friend Takis Benos from the University of Pittsburgh invented uh, a nice term for it. We, we, t we often talk about proteomics, uh, Gen genomics, and he invented the term ridiculomics. <laughs> <laughs> because it's so complex, nobody can ever know what, what is going on there. So, you need computational power to do, to do these things. We can provide assistance in the cure of genetic diseases with such an entity. And the third one is assisted governance. Bitcoin is an IQ test. In essence, the third one is happening as we speak. Because if you're dumb, you don't buy. You're staying out. Only smart people invented in Bitcoin. Look around you. Uh, and then there's extinction level events prediction, which is something really, really important for our existence here. We only exist in one backup, right? And here's Mr. Makrivagis. What next? <laughs> there's a very, very great text that was written in November 5, 1956 from Isaac Asimov. It has to do with a huge artificial intelligence that was uh, evolved to something that contained all human knowledge from all the millennia. And that was the question. Can this chaos not be reversed in the universe once more? Can that cannot be done? What I mean here is that this entity is literally limitless. What you imagine with the Google AI, AI, sorry, this can be done very, very fast, and it's going to be exponential, right? I want to thank all these people. The two of them are my professors at the University of Thessaly. This is Mrs. Athanasios Kakaroudas, which is an expert in cellular automata. This is Mr. Vasil Plagianakos. I want to thank Greg Wright, he's not here. Ian Grigg, he's here. Mr. George Papagiogiu and Joseph Folk of Berlin, he's not here either. And all of you. My question is, um, basically I'm an AI researcher and I've talked to a lot of researchers throughout the world in AI 
And, uh, every, and I really love genetic algorithms. The, the thing is, every researcher I ask, even from UCL, which is a great university doing machine learning and so on, they really avoid genetic algorithms. They, they kind of hate it. It's a kind of discrimination they have because they say there's no theoretical background that backs the story, but it, it works. I tried it on myself on my computer, it works. It's a black box, yes. Yes. So can you talk more about it and how can we open this black box? And how, let's say, I want to go to a researcher and convince him to do genetic algorithms. How do I convince him? How do I open that black box? And um, are there any theoretical backgrounds or some bounds, lower bounds? For example, in variational methods, in variational okay. variational inference, there's some. This is something that I'm writing into my paper, uh, which, is, uh, which already got a prize uh, at the Hellenic uh, Society of Biology and Bioinformatics. I presented it in, uh, last month in the Pasteur Institute in Athens. And uh, I state there that the whole process is done via calculations, right? That means Bitcoin network spends calculations in order to evolve these things and every GA is written back into the blockchain. And that's its memory. That means that when it learns something, it keeps it there for future users. So the neural network has access to all these GAs, which in essence are memories. And that's how it evolves. How do we uh, evolve a genetic algorithm? It's nearly a mystery. I believe that it's based on randomness. If you ask me, randomness equals intelligence. Percentage randomness and percentage Yeah, you, you, you need to, to ask it something. Yeah, so basically, uh, yeah. So basically uh, an extension to my question, I was doing a very interesting um, course in computational neurodynamics with Shana Khan back at Imperial College London when I was studying two or three years ago, so not that time ago. And he found that there is a peak at around 0 0.2, so 20% randomness. Yes, I am also stating the paper. Okay. So can, you, can after you elaborate that, a bit more on that? After Explain that, it in simple terms. Yeah, after it? that, the, the genetic algorithm dies. The mutation rate is too high. Another question? Yes. Okay. So now we have only one megabyte, and Luke says that we want uh, 300 kilobyte blocks. Can this come in? Yes. This is a very nice question. No, it cannot be done. Big data mining means big data. And big data mining means that you need bigger blocks. <coughs> that means that we need bigger blocks in order to machine learn the AI. You cannot store too much information in every block. Have you communicated with core developers? Can you them? No, I don't have access to them, sorry. I'm a researcher, I'm a bioinformatician. I don't, I don't have any idea about how this, these guys work. They kill the AI. Excuse core, me? Core developers kill the AI with uh, the block size. Yeah, but they, they don't really kill it, but they won't allow it to work, yeah. right? The machine learning is not working this way. So we need bigger blocks. Thank you.